Well, I hope you had a good season two of Thanksgiving just coming out. And it seems like we're taking big leaps forward, aren't we? Big leaps forward toward Christmas. I don't know if you're ready for it. I'm kind of ready for it. <laughs> it's, um, it was Helen's birthday yesterday. And we always tell her her birthday is when the snow comes. And this year it matched once more. <laughs> Never fails. So it was the snow coming down really nicely and heavy. And we celebrated her birthday. She's eight now. No, six, six sorry. <laughs> Liam turned eight. I always mix them up. <laughs> With the third kid, you know, he just mix them up. No, it's great. We, I love the season. There's something special about this season and that I always, I, I, I call it the season of lights just because we have a lot of lights out there. It's a season that's a little bit darker too and you see all the lights out there and it just feels like it's a season that's calming down. Part of it is if you're standing out in the forest or in the field somewhere, the snow just swallows up all the sound. Did you ever notice that? It's just beautiful. You stand out there and there's, no, there's not this usually noise all around you, but somehow all the sounds are swallowed up by the snow and everything seems to be so calm and, and, and really nice. And there's something special about it. I remember with this Christmas tree, this is actually how Jan and I, my, my wife, how we dated on uh, Continental Theological Seminary. The, the first night, um, we, it was after our Christmas dinner. We had a, a nice Christmas dinner. Uh, and afterward, we, we had our, our we had suit and ties, and she had a beautiful dress. And it was it kind of set up like this. We had a nice a chapel uh, there where we were doing the the um, just uh, sermons. We heard good uh, devotionals and sermons and preaching, and a great time of worship. And it was like this. And on the right side, there was a Christmas tree. And right under this Christmas tree, somehow we sat there and we talked. And then it was at nine o'clock, and we talked until four o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Talked all night. I think that was the beginning of us, wasn't it? Uh, it's a really nice season. But there's something special about this, this Christmas season and that we're celebrating with lights. Um, that's why I call it the season of lights. And I don't know if you know that, but um, a lot of people are aware of that. But the light symbolizes the coming of Christ. Do you know that? It's the coming of Christ. We have Christ who has been predicted, who has come into this world. Uh, the light shall shine out of darkness. Um, the Christ coming and he is the light and he's always symbolized with light. And since it's symbolizing the, the coming of Christ, I really want to tie in this whole story with, um, or the, the symbolism behind the, the Advent readings, uh, the wreath and the four uh, different candles. We have three purple candles, one pink candle, one white candle. Uh, you have heard of already a little bit in, in the Advent reading. I really want to use that as a backdrop all through the month of December. We have four Sundays leading up to Christmas, and then we have the 24th, our nice evening service uh, when we're going to light the Christ candle. And there's so much symbolism behind it that really just helps us. Actually, symbolism sometimes, you know, we can make it into a tradition that's unhealthy, but there is a couple healthy traditions that we're supposed to keep because it helps us to be focused. Amen? And the, the, the reading of the Advent, the Advent readings and lighting the Christmas candle was intended as a symbolism to help us focus uh, for the Christmas season. It, it was actually intended... Um, for reading to explain to our children uh, with each lighting of each candle what the symbolism is. The first candle was, is the candle of hope. Now, what stands behind the candle of hope? What is it actually? And I, I really want to use this as a backdrop. All through the month of December, we're going to be talking. I'm going to preach a, a series on um, the coming of the king. Um, there was somehow in my heart to, to preach about the coming of the king that for me is this fascinating story how from the Old Testament it was predicted that the king of kings will come and that his rule will be an everlasting rule. It will be an everlasting kingdom. And so you have this prediction of this great king that's coming right and he's being announced and he's coming he's coming he's coming the time is coming close and all of a sudden the king is here 
But the manger of the king who ruled in Israel was empty. <laughs> Instead, there was a little manger in a stable somewhere. In absolute poverty. And this is where the king all of a sudden came. And just, just the picture of this, the coming of the king culminating down into this poor situation somehow where the, there is a baby in the manger and that is the king that has been announced for thousands of years. It's an absolute fantastic picture and just the way that God uh, is working salvation history is mind-blowing somehow. And I really want to use this season to, to talk more about it. But f in order to do that, I want to use um, everything with the candles and with the symbolism of light uh, as a backdrop to it. And so today, we, um, I, I'm just going to mention what is the light, uh, what is the wreath, and then what is the first candle. Um, so let's start with the lights. Like, what, what, why, why is the Christmas season symbolized with lights? You know, we have in, in 1 uh, Timothy 6, verse, uh, chapter 6, verse 13, um, Paul writes to his pupil, Timothy, um, that God, it, this is the God who dwells in inapproachable light. God who dwells in inapproachable light. Do you remember in Revelation when it talks about the new creation, all this earth, uh, a creation will, will, will pass. God's worth, word will be forever. And so in, in the new heaven, in the new Jerusalem, in the new creation, guess what? There is not going to be a sun. The sun that shines. Because it says, because God and the glory of God shall be our light. There is not going to be, the, there is no need anymore for artificial light in our life because we are all going to be with the glory of the Father and with the glory of the Son. And there's going to be so much light that it's going to shine out everything. Can you imagine that? There is so much light. And this, this is the God who dwells in inapproachable light. And there, there's something more to light that is uh, n not only shining out the darkness so that we can see things, but there, with light comes warmth, right? When, we, when you're ever under cool or when, when you're cold and you light a, a flashlight, you have light, right? But it doesn't make you warm. <laughs> Maybe it's the illusion of warmth, but it's only when you light a, a candle, the, the, the real light somehow, that it, it, it just gives off some warmth. Um, if, when you have ever built an igloo, you know, there's this theory, I've never tested it. I think some of our guys, uh, they have tested it once uh, when they're going on, on, on the camps and building a nice igloo. But if you put one candle in an igloo, it actually heats the whole thing to a really nice temperature. All you need is just a little flame in an igloo that reflects all that heat, but a candle gives off warmth. It gives off not only light, but it gives off warmth. You know, sometimes here in the, in the church, when, when, uh, during the week when it gets really cold, um, I, I walk around in the, in the church here, and there is sunlight coming through those windows. And so when I'm really cold, I just stop by those windows, and I put my, my back a, against the, 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 the window, and I can just feel the warmth, right? This is what light is doing. Light gives you warmth. And now when, when it talks about that God is, it dwells in inapproachable light, and Christ is the light that has come into the world, there is something tangible about the presence of God that is more than just the revelation of the visible. There's something that comes with the presence of God that you can feel, that you can sense. It was just this morning, uh, just standing here in worship, when I just felt like this warmth coming down once more. It was kind of like during this last song, it was like when the presence of God is just coming, it's this warmth coming down. You know, this morning, Jen and I we were talking so much about uh, something that we believe is, is something that is really just deep in our culture somehow where we kind of just lost focus and on, on God. And I, I just call it, I boil it down to something that I call a divided heart. You know, we live in a culture and we live in a day and age where there's always going on a battle for our heart. 
a battle for our attention. We always live with a divided heart somehow. And it's only when we are choosing to declutter completely our life and focus only on God and giving Him the glory and whatever hinders us, whatever entangles us, to leave all of that behind. When we all of a sudden are in God's presence, then when we have an undivided heart, then all of a sudden there, there is something that comes that, that's way more than just head knowledge. It comes with the presence of God. It comes with the, with, with the warmth of God, the Holy Spirit. It's in a very tangible way. And this is what I like about the symbolism uh, with light. There is something that comes with it. And listen, if you have never felt it, if you maybe come from a different tradition and, and you know about the gospel, you know about Jesus Christ, but all this is is head knowledge and you have never felt this tangible warmth <laughs> that can somehow flood completely through your body and you, you just feel it. It elevates your spirit. It changes your speaking. It changes your talk. It changes your thinking. It changes the way that you behave. If you have never felt it, then there's a whole nother level to God, you know, that he wants us. It's like, like we sang in this last song, uh, that the breath of God is in our lungs. There's something that we need to be in the, in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And so this season of light is really r reminding us on this. God is in inapproachable light, but this light has come into the world. And it was predicted all through the prophets. And we have in Isaiah... Chapter 60, just the first couple of verses, listen to this. God speaks through the prophet Isaiah, and he's encouraging Israel in exile. And this is what he's uh, telling them. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the people. But the Lord will arise upon you and his glory will be seen upon you and nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. There is something here in the prediction that when this light comes into the world, nations are going to be drawn to it. People are going to be drawn to it. You know, you always realize it when you're, speaking, when you're among work colleagues uh, I, I notice it very often um, when, when I was uh, in between my, my studies, when I came back uh, in, in Austria and just worked at the secular job, everybody there knew that I was a Christian. And they, and they, usually, they usually started with people that didn't, get, didn't know me already. It was like in this work context and everybody was talking and gossiping and making dirty jokes and all kinds of jokes and everything. But there was something different about Arnold. There was something different about him. He wouldn't speak in the same way. He wouldn't laugh about the same weird jokes. There's something different about this guy. And then, uh, and you could always tell, like when you're a, among work colleagues, when you're going to school, and when there is the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, and somehow there is a difference from you than from other colleagues, they will start asking questions, Right? It's like people are being drawn to the light because we have this light in this earthen vessels that has cracks and this light is shining through those cracks. But the people are drawn to the light. You know, luckily not only mosquitoes are drawn to the light, we have moths too, right, and other critters. But every animal, somehow, they're drawn to the light, right? There's like, as soon as you have a light on, it's, if you have a mosquito in your room and you want to get it out, switch the light off, switch the light on in another room, and five minutes later, it's gone, and just shut the door and go to bed, right? It's like, it, animals are drawn to the light somehow, and it's the same. There's something about the light where people are drawn to the light, and this is why God uses the symbolism of, of light. It, it's the warmth. It's, it's, there's something about it that people hunger for the light. And this is why we have to feed ourselves on the light. That's why we have to get full with the light, to declutter our life and just get full with it because people are going to be drawn to it. All of a sudden, you realize you don't even have to go out on the street and evangelize. People are being drawn to the light. People notice that there is something different. They notice that there is a feel to it that they cannot describe. When the missionaries were here, 
And she said she, they could not preach the gospel there. And so what their way of evangelism was an open-door policy. Just keep the house door open. And people would just walk in and out, you know. But when they walk in, there was something different. People were drawn to the light. And people are coming to their house because they're drawn to a world that's different. She was talking about the, uh, there is no condemnation there. There was no ju judgmentalism there. There was just love in this house. It's like people are drawn to the line. I love that symbolism. So God has predicted this, um, that the light will come into the world. And then in, in Luke chapter 2, turn to Luke chapter 2. In Luke chapter 2, then the light has come in the form of Jesus Christ. And it was the little baby Jesus and the parents took little baby Jesus and brought him uh, to the temple to have him dedicated um, how it is usually custom back in, in Israel. And so, and there's this one guy, he's working as a priest there. His name is Simon. And in, in chapter 2, verse 25 and, and onward, um, this Simon appears. And it talks about this Simon, that he was a righteous and a devout man, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. As a guy who was walking in the Holy Spirit, I love it. Verse 27, and he came in the Spirit into the temple. And as he walked in the Spirit into the temple, there was, a young, there was, there was nothing special about this couple there this day. There was so many people come to the temple. They had, they had uh, hundreds of, of Levites serving at the temple at the same time because everybody would, uh, you know, they, they would devote their, their children and uh, bring altar sacrifices and everything. But so in this crowd, there's one couple, and for the natural eye, there's nothing special about this couple. There's one couple with one baby in their hands uh, among many. Let's just say it this way. But this Simon who comes in the spirit to the temple and gets a hold of this baby, all of a sudden he says something that's remarkable. And then he says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. He was old. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. There's something about this baby all of a sudden that makes him say that. You know, but my eyes, when, when I read this again, it falls so much on this verse 27 where it says, and he came in the spirit to the temple. You know, I believe if, if any other priest would have been there, maybe they would have just taken the little baby Jesus and would have just done the, the traditional uh, ritual, whatever, you know, but there's something special about Simon that when he is in the spirit and he comes, then God shows him the things that are not yet and the things that are to come. And I, I love that, that, that story because it shows us if we are in the spirit, we live a whole different lifestyle. We see a whole lot of different things that so many other people around us somehow miss out on. That's when we talked this morning about like uh, our culture. We live in a culture of divided hearts because there's always a battle going on for our hearts. If we, if we don't have a divided heart, if we are wholeheartedly committed to God and co completely in sync with Him, and He has all of us, every aspect of us, if He really just has everything of us, then we, we see the, the world in a different way. All of a sudden, we see the small things and we don't despise them any longer because we realize that this is where God is working. God is working here and God is working there. But only if we walk in the Spirit and if we're full with the Spirit of God do we recognize God's hand in the small things. Sometimes it's just like if you do dishes, right? <laughs> it's when we go shopping, 
It's in the small things. If we just see a person, if we talk with a person, if we pray for somebody, we don't even have to meet a person. Very often it's just God moves. Our, our, if we tune in with God after we have gotten through this first five minutes of prayer about unloading to God and telling him, storming heaven with everything that we need, all of a sudden when we come down and we hear, we, all of a sudden we have a sense for a certain person. Do you ever experience that? A sense for a certain person, then you start praying for that person. This is where God is moving. This is what God is doing. See, we only can be a part of God writing history if we are walking in the Spirit here, just like uh, Simon did. I love that. And then later on, but, but this whole thing is again with, with this, the light of revelation has come to the Gentiles and for the, and the, for the glory of, to your people, Israel. Again, the symbolism of light not only predicted but now has come. And the people that have the light, that have the light of the Spirit, they recognize the light. I think this is really important. If you have the light, you will see the light. If we walk in darkness, we will never see the light. We, we, we don't recognize it. We don't because it's a spiritual thing. And we can only see the spiritual thing with spiritual eyes. This is so important to recognize that light. And then during Jesus' ministry in John uh, chapter 8, then Jesus is saying this himself about his own ministry. In John chapter 8, verse 12, and Jesus spoke again, and he was saying, I am the light of the world, and whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I love that. You know, when Jesus is saying, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, I was wondering why he used the word follows me. He could have used the word believes in me, right? Right? The one who believes in me will not walk in darkness. But he uses the word walk in me. Walk. Whoever follows me, whoever walks with me. There is a difference between knowing what is right and doing what is right. And this is what Jesus is saying. Not whoever believes in me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. See, we can... It's like somebody walking with a torch in darkness. Uh, when we were kids, we were in youth camps, and there was one guy who had a huge torch, and he was leading the way, and everybody else was following. And it was our game always to hide in the forest, you know, and let them pass. And then and we come out, and then we join that train. But one thing I remember about this whole thing is when you stay in the light and you walk with the light, you have the light. Then you see where you're walking. But you can literally sit in darkness and, let the, and watch the light and know everything about the light. This is the light that's coming into the world to shine the way, to give us the salvation, to redeem our lives. And here it comes, and here it goes. <laughs> and we're not part of it. All we do is somehow have a knowledge about it. But Jesus says, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me. See, we have to get into the line of the one who is the light. And then when we walk with him in the light, we have the light of life. We want to have the light of life. I think it's a, it's a different terminology for saying the fullness of life. You know, if we want to have a rich life, uh, rich in experience and rich with everything that God had intended for our life, then we, th this is what he calls the light of life, the everlasting life. It's like the, the, the fullness of God in our life. Then we need to follow Jesus, not only think of him, not only know of him, not only to believe in him from a distance, but to step in line with Jesus Christ. And that usually leads wherever he wants to lead. <laughs> and it's not our way. It's not our way. You know, we can think our way, but the Lord walks His way. And it's a, it's a matter of following uh, and believing in Him and uh, leaving a legacy of obedience behind us that we have perfectly followed in step with, with Jesus. I, I love this. This is, this is the light that has come into the world that is symbolized. And this is, those are the implications of the light that we have with this light coming in, into this world. And those four lights 
are five lights, they're sitting on the wreath. And the wreath is usually a circle. And it's not stretched out, but it is a circle. Do you remember, you, we have all wedding rings. Do you remember the symbolism? Or some of us have wedding rings. Um, but do you remember the symbolism uh, about the ring? Why we have a ring and not just like a tag <laughs> around our neck that says, I am married. We have a ring because a ring has no end. It is, has no beginning, it has no end. And the, it symbolizes marriage, and we have a marriage coming up very soon, right guys? We have a marriage coming up very soon, and when the rings are changed, it means that it is a covenant that is supposed to last. It is before God. You know, it has, it has no end. There is, it's, it's an ongoing thing. It's a marriage that is an ongoing thing. And so when, when those candles, the light that has come into the world, when they're sitting on the circle, it is this everlasting uh, the everlasting life. It's, it's the, no end to it that is symbolized with it. And we have those four candles, and by tradition, those four candles that symbolize the 4,000 years by tradition from, from creation, from Adam and Eve, all the way until the light has come, Christ candle. Uh, those are 4,000 years. So we have for every thousand of years, for every millennial, we're lighting one candle it's actually when you think about this symbolism it's kind of cool because you could add actually two more candles for two more millennials to it can't you right you have four millennials leading up to the coming of christ and the lasting result we're still living in in the period of grace we could actually add two more candles to it because god's because of god's faithfulness but the first candle that we are lighting is the candle of hope. It is a candle of hope. And I just want to mention that with one scripture, and this is from Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And the Apostle Paul talks here to the Romans very clearly about this hope, but in a very special way too. And he again, he goes back to Isaiah and he quotes Isaiah in verse 12 and he says, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope I love it. He calls God the God of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit again. I love it. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. <laughs> you can't read the Bible without the Holy Spirit. So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. This is the hope candle. The hope candle is sometimes also called the candle of prophecy because the light was the light of hope was promised to us. But you know what? Today we talk so much about uh, it has already been all fulfilled. <laughs> we we talk about this this everything has come already that we somehow miss a very important aspect of our faith, and that is the hope for the coming, the hope for our own personal future, and that has not yet come. You know, we, we, we live in a time, when, when the Apostle Paul here wrote, uh, in him will the Gentiles hope. He's not talking about an event in the past. It's interesting, he talks about farther down the road, the Gentiles believed in Jesus Christ. And now the Apostle Paul could say, look back, it's like, as they have believed in the coming hope that came already. But he's not saying that. He says, in him will the Gentiles hope it's for a future that's still out there. It's something that's still from, through that period of death, you know that this is not the end of life. Their future hope is still out there. 
It's not past. It's still out there. Sometimes we're living in this illusion. Um, there's something called in eschatology. Eschatology is the study of the last things about the prophecy and when they're going to be fulfilled. And there's one uh, theological view about the eschatology, the last things, the end time prophecies, that is called the realized eschatology. That literally believes that every event uh, predicted by Jesus and in the Bible that you have, it, it has already happened. It has already happened. And we already live in the end times and this is already, everything has already happened. It's the realized eschatology. Sometimes I believe we're living already, we, we are so much into the habit of, of living a realized hope already, of living a realized Christianity already, where somehow we go in, day in and day out about our life and we are saved and this is it. We are living the resurrection life, you know, we are living our hope already, our hope has come and we're living our hope, we're living our resurrection life and this is it and I can just do whatever I want you know because I'm living in this in this realized hope already but the Apostle Paul reminds us that no we are hoping for something that's still out there we are hoping for the redemption of our bodies for the adoptions of sons and that's what makes the Apostle Paul in another letter say so that by all means I even want to be like Christ in his death so that by any means possible I might also attain to the resurrection from the dead he knows that there is something that's still out there when we get our upward call of God in Christ Amen? That's, that's the hope that's not only a realized hope in our life because the hope has come already, but there is a part of this aspect because one thing that happens if we already live in a realized Christianity and everything is here and now already, <laughs> we start turning in circles, right? <laughs> we really do. We just start turning in circles. But we need to keep a goal in, ahead of us. And that's the hope of glory, the hope of a redemption, the hope of the adoptions as son. And as we're keeping this ahead of us, we tend to walk a straight line instead of walking in circles and just wandering off and here and there. And I think this is very important when we're um, talking about the season of light with this first candle, and the first candle symbolizes this pretty well. And I just want to close here really quick with just reading this passage again from Paul uh, in Romans 15. The root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. It's the candle of hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of this Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Amen? Hey, let's just stand. I just want to close in prayer. I ask you in, for this season of leading up until Christmas as we're progressing in our sermons, as we're talking about the coming of the King and we light each candle, use this season for yourself to really just tune in to God, to teach your children about it and to keep it in front of, of everyone uh, in your household, in your family, of what this means. What does this hope symbolize for us? It's not only in the now, in the here and now, but there's still an aspect out there that we're supposed to focus on. Holy Father, we just thank you for this Sunday. We thank you for this first.